Wow. Well, welcome, girls. <laughs> Finally, I have been trying to do this forever, and it's a special treat for the season, I guess. Yes. Tis the season to be friendly. Tis the season to be jolly. <laughs> Mary Pierce and Joanna Law. Now, the story behind these two is hilarious. Obviously, I'm a middle friend of both of theirs. They live about 200 yards from each other, are in the music industry, never really met properly. So we're better to bring them together than the all new Zoom meetings that everyone's doing. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. welcome, Joanna. Welcome, Mary. You know, I love you both. So we have to start there. Tell the me how you're coping. The feeling is mutual, Barry. Lots of love going on in this. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely what we need. <laughs> I've been seeing your daily updates, Mary, <laughs> live and direct from somewhere in South London. South London, you know, it's always going to be, you know, I'm not leaving tier three, never mind tier four. Well, tier four, we'll get to later because I don't know where that came from. But how did you get on with your leg of land this morning? Honestly, the queue, at, I go to a lovely butcher's in East Dulwich called uh, William Rose advert, advert. But um, the queue was ridiculous. The queue was at least a mile and a half long. Wow. And I was at the back. And after 15 minutes, I had moved forward four steps. Well, I can tell you that would have been Larry's Lamb's pass from me. So, because... Or now <laughs> I would still be in the queue. So, Miss Joanna, mm -hmm. how are you? Have you been queuing for Lamb or...? <laughs> no, I've managed to dodge the queues. Um, we we will probably queue for a turkey, though. We go to the Billings on Sydenham High Street. Oh, yeah. I, um, I've got to go there today. And, right. So uh, I have to say, they both live 200 yards from each other in Sydenham. Yeah. And she's mentioned Billings in Sydenham. For those who don't know, across the Atlantic, Sydenham is the nucleus of South <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say <laughs> you can afford to buy a house around here you can't afford like 200 yards up the road you can't Indeed. But, Indeed. You, know, you can at least you afford to buy a house around here mm. so you'll be queuing for a turkey I do I do think yes yeah well I'm I might I might not myself but I might um get my better half to go and do that bit poor Alex that's what Poor that's Alex. what that's what you have your children and your your husband for. Okay. <laughs> but no, coming back to Sydenham High Street, I think it is one of the perhaps one of the last sort of real proper London sort of high streets. You know, I mean, it is. You know, I think all high streets change and 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 develop, but. I don't know. I, I love Sydenham High Street. I think but it's 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 actually I think known as it's one of the longest high streets in the south. Yeah. I mean, officially, it's one of the longest high streets in the south of London or south of England or something. Yeah. It's a really long high street. But I I love where I live. I mean, I've lived in the vicinity either in Penge or in in Sydenham for the last 20 years. <laughs> obviously since I was four um, years and <laughs> you stay there Barry. <laughs> I didn't say if, a word. If you so can... I hope you're all getting this information about Sydenham, the longest high street in South. Um, those in Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York <laughs> and uh, you know globally Sydenham is a long street. Okay now <laughs> <laughs> Lovely Mary, I want to hear you tell your musical journey story because I've known you forever. Well, it seems like forever since we were both two and a half. And um, you know, wherever she goes, I follow her musically as she well knows, wherever she's performing. And I actually get angry if she's like, well, I've got a gig tonight, but I didn't tell you because it's a bit far and uh, well, tell me and let me decide. You okay. don't decide that. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've learned that. I learned that lesson. <laughs> I learned that lesson back in the day. I either I keep it to myself. Yes, and do it in secret, which I'm sure she's done secret, several and I, times. And mm. then I get cussed out 
two months <laughs> after. The but um, no, I think, well, I started singing, like most kids do, I think, through church, school. Oh, right. So your journey started in music as young as a child. It wasn't something you Yeah, you know, I've always had a passion for it and a, and a love of, of singing or being the centre of attention. And, um, you know, I thought I was going to be... <laughs> I thought I was going to become an actress. I really did. Um, some may still... Some may say I still am, but you are um, absolutely. If you know Mary Pierce, she's but, an actor. I Trust love. Me, I, she had people singing "Merry Christmas" in the queue that was a mile long this morning. I witnessed it myself. Oh, I did. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you, darling. Yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, I've always um, like love singing, and I come from a long line of West Indian family, and you know. I was definitely told to get a proper job when I was in my teens and, you know, have a backup plan. Um, but you only have a backup plan if you plan to fail at plan A. So, um, yes, you don't really think I'm going into this, but I'll do that to, you know, as you say, a backup plan. Yeah. And, you know, those of a certain generation that's why I'm surprised that there's so many black people in music because, you know, <laughs> older parents of a certain generation, they're like, well, I don't know what that is, but you need to go and learn a trade. Yeah, my dad didn't get mentality? it. My dad didn't get it. Um, you know, he seen me sing on TV with you name it. And, and he just, he just didn't understand it. And then he said, okay, so, you know, after maybe sort of 10 years of being a singer and, I was at my parents' house, I, you know, and a uh, telephone rang and it was um, a, a singer of sort of the, um, a, mus a musician of the sort of uh, fame of like Des O'Connor or, you know, Jimmy Tarbuck and... Um, <laughs> yeah, that era. Um, it was actually Kenny Lynch. Okay. Rang my dad's house and my mum's house and, and my dad answered the phone and and I was upstairs decorating as you do as pair as kids, you know, you go down and you do other things for them. And the phone rang and my dad answered the phone, oh, hold on a minute, Mary? Yes, dad. Mary, yes, dad. There's a man on the telephone. He said his name is Kenny Lynch. You remember the black boy that used to come on television? His name was Kenny Lynch, isn't it? And I went, Dad, yes, that is Kenny Lynch. What? Kenny Lynch is in my house. You make it, girl. You make it. So, you know, he's seen me on TV with Shaka Khan. He's, uh, you know, I've been on tour with Donna Summer. Been on tour with, you know, did stuff for Michael Jackson and this one and that one and touring here, there and everywhere. You know, phone calls to him from Japan and, but when it Kenny wasn't Lynch, tangible until it came from somebody that he knew. He knew. And that yeah. was the only time he was, I recognised that I had made it when Kenny Lynch rang my parents' house. <laughs> I love it. Now you, Joanna, you kind of come from a musical family as well. I interviewed Simon a few weeks ago. <laughs> and now let me say, Simon, former member of Soul to Soul, who wrote Keep On Moving and Back to Life. Okay, so Joanna, I know you kind of come from a musical family and Simon did correct me and tell me it was your father, your, your mother, not so much your father. Oh, uh, without a doubt, yeah. Um, although it's really interesting, you know, um, it goes back further than that. So my mum has a lovely story. She's 84 now. And um, I think her, her dad's grandmother was a maid in a big London house they come they all come from um Barnet and Edmonton way so on my mum's side and um she was literally a, a housemaid in this house you know goodness knows in the turn of the century and um she she was singing she whenever she was working she was singing and the the guy um, who you know owned the house who she worked for said you you need to you need to join a choir because you've got a really beautiful voice 
so um in the end she ended up joining a choir and and you know w went on to do lots and lots of singing and um, changed her so, life completely she was no longer a maid well i i don't know i don't know if she made a career out of singing but certainly she was able to sort of um instead of just be cleaning the house and singing she was able to go and sing you know a some kind of a professional level yeah and um and so i i don't know i just feel um my my grandfather my mum's dad was a great singer um i don't know there's something about singing in our in our family that that, that actually you know precedes my mum who who you know then went on to Something's uh, happening with your mic. With a, um, yeah, with a, um, you know, she did a, you know, degree in classical singing. So, uh, yeah, music, music uh, and singing has just been part of our family, obviously, from the beginning. Um, so tell me how you got into singing and music. Well, uh, so... I have this, I have this sort of strange memory of um, music from, uh, from I don't know where, but I, I can only say that when I was uh, conceived and, and when I was born, um, my, my parents were living and working in Trinidad and my mum was asked to um, direct the steel pan choir uh, steel pan band in Chaguanas yeah. in Trinidad and I often wonder where my love for sort of soul music black music came from because actually my mom was a classical singer right but I can only imagine that actually it started there and since I've trained in um, you know psychology psychotherapy I know that you know those formative times even when a child is in the womb you know okay. if, if they're hearing music uh that will be part of their makeup yeah. because I, I i don't know i don't know where my passion my love of all music comes from but i know but i know that it is there and i know it's deep within me so well i mean that's definitely with you <laughs> john and simon yeah yeah so it is fascinating and um, I don't know, I, I, my dad was a vicar so we always, we were all, all singing in the choir right from the word go. Okay. Um, not, you know, this was, a, this was obviously in the Church of England but, you know, nonetheless music and worship was just part of what we did. Right. Every That's Friday, every, every Sunday, that was where we would would be in the church singing so there we go that's where it comes from yeah. but then you and Simon in particular chose to take it to a professional level yeah well um I don't know we just we it just seemed like the natural thing when when I was I Funnily enough, um, someone today was talking about earth wind and fire and there's this beautiful song Jupiter because it was connected with you know, the Jupiter and Saturn and stuff. And um, I don't know, I, Simon too, you know, when we, when I was in my teens and Simon was just sort of, he's six years older than me. He, he took me to see Earth, Wind and Fire when I was 13. Right. I mean, I, I mean, how lucky was that? You yeah. know, I can't believe how lucky I am, but I had a brother who would take me to see these people. Um, so, yeah, we, we just, we, we experimented with lots of music, lots of bands we were in. And then, of course, we started to make records when, when we could. Right. And that, that, was, that was then the start of something completely different. <laughs> yeah, he told me a lovely story of you all going to the Africa Center to see, on a Sunday night, Soul to Soul, of course, where we all used to go. Yeah. And um, that was y'all's connection to Soul to Soul and Jazzy, who at that time was a sound system, wasn't a really a band yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah, it was a sound system. Uh, 
<clears throat> excuse me, I, I just have such amazing memories of going to the Africa Centre and, you know, all the best DJs were there. So Norman Jay, Giles Peterson, you know, all yeah. the best guys under this one roof brought together by Jazzy and, and H and, and Q. And um, that was just, oh my God. How, because that's where their that first experience single broke. Never leave me. <laughs> which was um, Rose Windrush's Fair Play. Mm. That's where their first single broke, Africa Center. And, you know, I, Simon saying that, oh, well, he just went to Jazzy and said, listen, I've got this song. And they developed it. And, you know, it's now celebrating its 30th year, another remix, 30th year of Back to Life. It yeah. just seems to keep coming back to life. <laughs> but, it, but, it's a, it, but it's part of that, that British soul scene that was going on at that time. I mean, I was there in a, you know, my sort of, Afrocentric regalia and dressed up, ready for Africa Center. With all, I've still got some of my necklaces that I used to wear and my beads and stuff like that. You know, it was a good time and my wet look. It was a great time, absolutely <laughs> great time. But yeah. you now, the reason I brought you together is because you're both two people that I love and you're both in music and both have singles out at the moment. Mm. Now, Miss Mary Pierce, we're going to deal with you first because we've had this conversation, okay? And I'm dragging it out of her, right? So she has a single out at the moment, which is called... Uh -huh. Well, there's a few things out. I mean, I, the whole thing, uh, there's a track called Freaky Toe. And I right. know it sounds weird, but the 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 whole premise is behind um, a, a a guy that I know he's a drummer uh, called Richie Stevens and we started this project about six years ago um, and it's just taken um, like it's been a real labour of love between him me um, Derek Green um, uh, Omar uh, Lee Scratch Perry um, um, uh, uh, George Clinton, um, you know, you name it. I mean, these, and it's called- So it's a collaboration of many people. It's so many people. Right, okay. And, uh, it's called the Smudge All-Stars is, wow. <laughs> is the project, but it's funk of the highest order. Right. And we've been getting some fantastic reviews here and across the pond. Right. Um, one of my friends called me the other day and it was a very sort of like, hi Mary, I, I just would like to talk to you. Um, I just need you to give me a call back because I'm here listening to Freaky Toe, my friend Kevin. <laughs> he absolutely goes, I can't believe it. The tune is wicked. Ah, you're just going mental for it. Well, you know, once George Clinton is involved, it's going to be funk and well, serious funk. Can I tell you, we, we recorded at a, a studio in um, West London, um, which is a well-known studio, but we recorded there. And uh, on the morning of the session, uh, my friend Richie called me and he said, look, um, would you mind going to the W Hotel, which is, which is in Shepherd's Bush? And just, um, he goes, I'll meet you there. Cause you know, I'm coming from South East, so I'm going out to West London. He said, can you meet me at the W and pick me up and go? So, you know, I have my little convertible. <laughs> and I'm sitting there waiting. And um, I called him and said, look, I'm outside. And he goes, oh, we'll be out in a minute. And I said, we'll? Oh, I said, I'm not cabs are us. I had no idea what was going on. And then out walked George Clinton, who got into the front, well, Barry knows, but there was, there's not really a back seat in my convertible. It's a parcel shelf, but two small people, one of which was Richie and George's wife. <laughs> and then George Clinton got into the front seat beside me in my convertible. I was just, couldn't keep my eyes on the road, you know, I just kept looking. <laughs> is, this really <laughs> is this really happening? Is this really happening? Yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, got to the studio. There was a lot of like musical exchanges because sometimes when you do music, you exchange 
product and abilities with other artists. So, you know, George was there to do one session for another wow. artist. Richie was there as the producer for that artist. He knows George and George did the bit on the first track. Then he exchanged production with Richie on this second track. And then we, we were all doing sessions on both. So there was about six singers on that. Um, and I was just as proud as could be. I mean, I was there from sort of like 10 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock at night. I just didn't want to go home. Yeah. Um, I want this, this moment to last forever. <laughs> forever, honestly. And, um, you know, George was very generous of, of what he was doing and watching him, um, which to, to kind of do his parlance, his rap, his whatever thing that he brought to he the He does. Track. That is very George Clinton. Yeah. I was gobsmacked. He absolutely... And, you, you know, and he just dug, he just did little like snippets. Up is just a place to fall down. Up is just a place to fall down from. <laughs> and the, the track was about record companies and what they can and, and shouldn't do for artists. And um, that was an amazing experience. But that was like five years ago. And then, you know, We've done other tracks since then and, 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 and just, yeah, so the Smudge All-Stars and um, Free well, it, it, So it's taken that length of time for it to come to fruition to where it is today. For it to come to, uh, honestly, it's so, it's amazing, you know, and I think for Richie, it's his, as a producer, it's been his baby. It's been his real labour of love. He's an awesome drummer and he's you know British drummer but he has had the pleasure of playing for George Clinton and Funkadelic you know it doesn't come around that kind of gig very often but he has done that and, and you kind of think six years for a project to come into fruition is quite a long time but I think that's how it should be you yeah. know I mean there is a sort of a mode of movement now where people are just churning stuff out that it tends to re you tend to repeat yourself I think well if absolutely you... but what I was gonna say is it's great that it takes that time because you know it, as you say it's done with love and care and attention and yeah. but talking to Gary Hines of the Sounds of Blackness mm. I was shocked to hear that they started in 1969 but really only came into our orbit in 1991. And you know, that is a wow. perfect example of people don't see the toil and the journey that goes into the success. They just see it when the success arrives and they kind of think, oh, you're a one minute wonder or you just did it overnight. But actually, yeah, you know, yeah, it's I think oil, it's, it's effort, it's, yeah, because you've got, to, you've got to kind of, you've got to have a message. You've got to have a story to tell. I mean, you know, there are artists like um, Maxwell who brought out that Black Summer's Night album a few years ago and it took eight years for it to, from his previous album, a lot of, I, I, I think a lot happened in his life in that period. Right. But he, he actually had something to write about that I wanted to hear. Okay. You know, um, but I think, you know, I think taking your time over a project is okay. Um, yeah. As long as you can pay your bills in the interim. Well, that's the thing. Fine. And I think that's where most people actually give up along the road because they're like, well, you know, I'm putting so much into this, but I'm not getting enough out financially, but they're not looking down the road to see what is possible. Mm. And, you know, I guess needs must if you need your rent paying or you need money for your food bills. That's what you need. But, you know, yeah. I think that quite possibly could be one of the reasons why people tend to give up along the way, you know, because they, they, they can't sustain it, whether it be gumption to do it or financially. Mm. So you, Joanna, when did you have your first single? 
Well, I'm smiling at this and reflecting on this conversation because it's so interesting. And actually, when I was listening to your interview on Sunday, Barry, what, what was interesting was that, and people, you know, people have said this to me, you know, oh, um, you know, we thought you'd given up singing or, oh, you still sing. And I'm like, well, you know, once you are a musician and a singer, you you never, I mean, really, you never stop doing that. I mean, there have been times when I've thought, oh, maybe actually, maybe I will, you know, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't let you stop. No. You know, things come up and then you suddenly think, oh, I want to, you know, you, you become uh, inspired by something and then you write about it and then you, you do it. Yeah. So, but what I was going to say was that, um, so, um, 30 years ago was when first time ever was um, I recorded first time ever so that was 1990 right. but, but, but previous to that um, Simon and I had started making records in 1987 and so I've got this album coming in in the new year called Rhythm of Years which is post 1990 up to um, sort of mid nine mid 19 yeah nine you know sort of all the music i made records of um between 1990 1995 actually and then song for theo came along so that was 2000 so but these are all on vinyl so so this stuff that i am now trans you know that is now thankfully being put on um digital platforms is all stuff that was on vinyl and it has wow. been a real labor of love for me to you talked about a labor a labor of love mary mm. it, it it's it's been my dearest wish to to get all this stuff together um and to put it in one place but so you know the album is a compilation say of various works over the years it's not actually new material as such. No, no. So so then, I know the single that you sent me and you were talking about as the single was one that's revamped of of old. No, so this the the recent one, Skin on Skin, I recorded right. that in 1993, would you believe? Right. And actually that was never released on vinyl. So um, that sat on a in a dat, you know, on a dat. Lots of <laughs> a dat wow I'm not even old enough to know what that word means. Please explain what a dat is, darling, for Gosh. our viewers. <laughs> don't don't ask me about all the technicality, but um, it's a little it's an audio tape. thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but you know, a dat. That's again. Brilliant. I don't know. Things things come when they're ready. I think, and when you're ready too. So um, for me now, this is all the stuff. That needed to come out um and and thankfully i've got the support of a, a lovely little label who is helping me to do all this um simon and i are, are also trying to do a, a new song um whereas he's in toronto and i'm here so we, we'll get that done in the new year but i love how you guys are because you know you're both into music originally but you've both gone and learned other things so you've you've studied psychotherapy he's now working in Canada in therapy with dementia and Alzheimer's yeah um so you know it's it's good that you you've kept the music there as you say because the music can never leave you it's inside you it's there forever but you know you've thought there are other things I need to or want to at least learn about and contribute. And I know Simon's taken this journey because of your father's yeah. episode with Alzheimer's, which was quite severe. And, you know, it touched him and he felt like he wanted to do something, you know, meaningful. With. Well, I, I, when I reflect on, on careers, I, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, you know, Mary, I, I, I'm always fascinated by by um, singers who, you know, do 
that uh, that incredible job of you know doing background vocals mm. and I often wonder because I'm not <laughs> I I don't know I I I often wonder actually and, and and muse a little bit about it whether I should you know if I had my time again maybe I would have pushed to to work more in 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 do in singing you know backgrounds and, and doing session work and stuff. session work yeah yeah, yeah. It, it can be a double-edged sword I have to say you know you can sort of blur the line between whether you are the artist or whether you are um the supporting singer artist you know um so it can blur the lines which is which which can be kind of unfortunate um because sometimes you can get asked to do your own gig with your own band and then also get asked to do backing vocals for an artist and that can be more lucrative than doing your own gig um unfortunately for me that hasn't happened too often often I've sort of chosen the times of year when I'm when I'm touring that I do more for my own music than I do um, for other people but at at this point with what we're living through um, I mean I was forced to go and put a studio in (laughs) so I can record at home so I've done the deep, the deep learning curve of having to learn how to use digital studio audio, wow. la, 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 at home and record. Go at Mary, home. go Mary, go <laughs> Mary. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it's, it's a real, you know, you never stop sort of critiquing your vocal and kind of go, oh no, it doesn't sound right. I'll record that again. Oh yeah, no, it doesn't sound right. You know, I, I do like. Um, I mean, we did the Smudge All Star thing. We did that pre-COVID. It was it was finished by 2018, but it only just came out October of the first single came out in October. What? Yeah. Really? So yeah. It, it was pretty much no. I, I say we'd stop recording in in October in in 2018, but then. In 2019, there was still a few more tweaks and this and that. No oh, production and stuff, yeah. Could you come in and sing the third line of the second verse? <laughs> oh, okay. You know, and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I love what I do. It's But it's really hard to balance between being the artist and this, the, the session singer. Yeah. yeah, I always find this interesting because I've often been to gigs and I can hear that that backing vocalist is by far and I'll dare to say it a superior vocalist to the one that is actually the star and they're making them sound good but it's really the backing vocalist who is is just in the shadows 20 feet from I mean, stardom, babe. 20 that must be so frustrating. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's so strange because I've been having conversations with my son who's who's wanting to become a professional singer. And I and I want, you know, I'm really encouraging him to do his craft. Because I, I I don't know. I we we started the conversation talking about you know having other careers and doing singing but also doing other things but i you know i i would always encourage young young musicians young singers if if they want to sing then sing you know just right. you know I, I i you know you 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 can do it if you if you want to do it you can do it and um, yeah I guess you can do most things it's whether you've got the perseverance to continue the journey and fight the obstacles jump over the obstacles that are put in front of you and and whether you've got the the gumption to do it because as we said earlier I guess a lot of times people fall by the wayside not because they're not talented but because they didn't have the gumption to go that extra bit and last that bit longer, whether it be their character personality or their financial circumstance. Mm. There are lots of things that, that affect, you know, the journey you make and how you make it. But you've you got to have a plan. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have a plan. And, and 
it's often there's support coming. And I always say this, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, I did everything all on my own. I'm a self-made person. It's like support comes from different places that are, you know, it not, might not necessarily be financial. Financial does help, of course, if you're in a bind. Mm. But, you know, support comes in so many ways that help you to get through those difficult situations where you need that little extra bit of, you know what, I'm going to persevere. I'm not going to give up. And, and those are the ones probably that get through. Yeah, I think you've got to, I mean, you know, I think I I think I had a plan. I think I've kind of um, reached a peak in like in two thousand and between two thousand and ten and two thousand and sixteen. There was a peak. I was busier than ever, and here, there, 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 and everywhere. And I, you know, I will sing from rock, pop, soul, funk, jazz. You know, I'll sing it all. Um, but then again, as I said, it can blur the lines as be between who you are and then and what you do, you know. And and I get asked that question. Oh, so you still sing then? Oh, what do you do for a proper job? <laughs> no, nobody dare ask you that question. Honestly, I mean, I, I've had people that I'm working for. Just the one thing, but but I he just <laughs> asked me, you know, after a gig. You know, we're sitting there and we're talking. I think we're in the airport and we're going home. And I've been out on the road with him for six weeks. And then he said, he was not the turn. He was, you know, one of the other part of the band. But he said, so is this what you do for a living? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, so, so you don't do anything else to earn money? No, this is what I do for a living. This is, and I, I'd say, you pay me, and then I take that money and I pay my mortgage and and do what I need to do. And he just didn't. It didn't occur to him that that is what I did for a living. For no. him, he's been an artist for thirty plus years, and he just didn't understand that there were musicians out there that did that for a living. Well, to, now to me, that is incomprehensible. I could understand it coming from the mechanic or the plumber who, who've got that kind of thinking. But if you're an artist that is actually employing these people, well, you're doing it for a living. So why would you ask the people that yeah, you've I, employed? Yeah, but I think for him, it was a bit of a fad, you know, that lasted for 30 years. Right. And I think the industry was so slowly retiring him without him really realizing it because he hadn't kept up, <laughs> hadn't kept up and hadn't reinvented himself and sort of relied on old historical stories to keep him in the limelight. Right. So your first single was what, Joanna? Was it first time? Hmm, that's a good question. Gosh. I well, love when I ask artists this and they actually go, um, <laughs> shouldn't it be no. off the top of your, off the cuff? <laughs> well, the thing is, the, the first um, single under my name, so Joanna Law, was First Time Ever. Yeah. Right. I, okay. The cover of um, that beautiful song, The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face. But, but I remember that, that was a 90s hit. That was a 90s club yeah, party I mean, it hit. Was a, it was a really it was a, an underground hit, shall we say. Uh, it never completely crossed over, but um, yeah, it's it's held very dear by a lot of people, which is so lovely. Um, given that obviously the the obviously people who'd sung it before, you know, there there are some songs you think, oh, maybe I better not touch that because. Yeah. Roberta yeah. Flack, The Temptations, you know, that all these people have done these versions of it. Um, but that was Simon's idea. So I just said, OK, we'll do it. Anyway, that's another story. But um, no, um, my um, Simon and I did a, a song called Love Is Not Enough, which will be on the album. There's some beautiful versions of it. Um, so that was 97. 
the, we then did a tune called City Heat, which was the name of what we called ourselves, City Heat. Right. And then we did a um, like an EP called, uh, which was called London Child. And there's three songs on there, and that was late eighties. So, yeah. oh, late eighties. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So again, another thing of the journey and when it starts and how long it takes and how much you've got to put in and how much you've got to do before you actually, you know, get that one spotlight on you. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was Jazzy actually who we we probably took a, along a white label to to the Africa Center. And, you know, Simon just sort of popped it over the, the parapet of the DJ box and sort of, you know, as you did in those days, you just kind of tried to catch somebody's eye and say, yeah, look, we've got this. He told me um, that story. And um, bless him, you know, that was the beginning of something. Goodness me, you know. Yeah. Um, but he did play, I think he played City Heat. Um, right. And then because he said he went to the Africa Center with the vinyl, yeah. gave it to Jazzy because he said, I've just got to get him to hear it. I just need him to hear it. Once he hears it, yeah. I know it's going to happen. So he went down to Africa Center with you in tow, baby sister, yeah. and <laughs> slipped it over. And he said, from Jazzy heard it. That's when he said, we've got to work together. It's as simple as that. Yeah. You know? yeah. Being so, in the right place at the right time with the right amount of perseverance. Yeah. And I mean, Simon's not the most pushy of characters either. So yeah, I can't yeah. even envisage him going, listen, listen to my tune. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But he obviously did and it worked. Yeah, and the music speaks, the music speaks. Yeah. But it's interesting what you were saying about um, Mary, the, you know, doing um, sessions. And, and so in um, the mid nineties, I started to do some session work for um, what you might call sort of trance outfits. So I did three, I, th I sang on three sort of trance tunes, um, which were top 20, all three of them were top 20 hits at the time. Mm. Okay. And then with that, I did, you know, I did a whole sort of European tour with those songs. Yeah. So, but but to me, you know, with with the greatest of respect, you know, that genre didn't really wasn't really my thing. Okay. But it, you know, that's where I <laughs> that's where I made. Do you know what? That's where I made some money. Big yeah. box, little box. Yeah, I tell you totally. I mean, I <laughs> felt like I was in a long dark tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know. I don't know. It, it's a strange journey. It's a strange journey, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, Liz, you, Barry, you spoke to um, one of my, like, sisters in this industry, Beverly Skeet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, earlier this year, and she is, like, at the top of her game, Session World, and also a fantastic artist in her own right. She has somehow managed to um, have so, both feet in each pond and she manages it quite well. Um, but again, a fantastic, talented singer, British, and, um, you know, gigging still, touring still, well, as much as COVID will allow. And um, there's not much, there's no touring going on at the minute. No. But I, I think that, it's a tricky, it's a tricky road and you just got to, yeah, hang on, hang on to your hate knee and just put both feet forwards and go and just do the work. I, I, I love what I do. I really do. I really love what I do for a living. You can see it. You can see it. You can see, you feel everything that you sing. And not that they were my favorite years, but... You guys at Singers, the very Beverly Skeet that you mentioned, they were some of my favorite times. Even as I'm saying it now, I can feel goose pimples. Oh, totally. Yeah, I can feel it. You know, the, the whole Singers, um, which moved to various venues around mm -hmm. London, the amazing Kevin Callan. Absolutely. You know, we and owe him a debt. Jeb. 
Yeah, Jeb Million. We all owe Kevin um, and Jeb um, a real debt of, and I mean, I came in sort of like halfway through that era. Um, and it's almost as if it was used as a place to hone your careers. It's exactly what it was for. You know, you were honing their careers. Was, like sometimes they'd pick up the mic and not write, okay, start again. It was almost like a rehearsal, but you go, it's just a live it's where jam. you went but to learn your craft. It was so special. And I can tell you, I literally followed that around London from Milk Bar to Hanover Grand to the old Cockney. And to where it, um, and and it, where it ended up the spot in Covent Garden. Yeah, and it was a it was at that what's that church place that was Limelight. On, Limelight. It was in there yeah. for a while. Yeah. Um, it it even moved to some place on Fulham Palace Road for a minute. The Orange. Um, uh, no, the Orange was that was songwriters. That's right. Okay. Yeah. 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 And oh. then there was. See, I used to follow this woman all over the place. There was okay. Voices <laughs> that was run by Ian Worrell. Ian Worrell, which was at Zenon's. Which was at Zenon. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there was, you know, we all sort of hung around. I mean, everybody's like, oh, Mary, do you remember doing the, the Milk Bar? And I said, no, that was before my time. I was still... Yeah, Milk Bar was early, early days. I was early doors. That I was, I was still at college when the Milk Bar was happening. So um, when was that? When did that all happen? When was that happening? That was the early nineties, mid eighties, end of the eighties, early nineties. Yeah, like milk bar time would have been end of the eighties. Yeah, um, and if you were a real music person or knew people who were into me, because it wasn't big then. Um, if you knew, if you were really into music, knew a lot of music people, musicians, singers, that's the only way really you would would have known about milk bar or gone down there. Yeah. What I did notice is going as it transitioned from place to place, you saw it become more of a commercial entity. So by the time it got to Hanover Grand, it was it was grand, <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, It was a way of you sort of trying, learning your craft. You could invite record companies down to see you. And yeah, almost like an, an, an impromptu showcase. Just come and see me sing, see what well, you think. Well, Zenon was a definite, Zenon Voices was a definite showcase. There was always some, um, I got sessions in there, artists coming up to me, Juliet, the great Juliet Roberts coming up to me and saying, oh, would you do a session for me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Juliet yeah. Roberts. And I mean, I have to say, and Mary knows this, there's three singers. You can have all the rest. This one here, Mary Pierce. Beverly Ski, Juliet Roberts, I'm on the floor. I don't even think I survived to the end of the gig because I passed out by the second song. <laughs> it's like paramedics are going, and clear. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, you know, those ladies that you mentioned, I'm, I'm honoured to be in that sort of linkage, but those ladies that you mentioned before, those are my go-to females. Um, in this industry, Juliet, Beverly, other people that I kind of, I, I call them regularly and go, okay, so I did this track and they want to pay me, Threepence so hate me for it, but <laughs> I've sung, I sang the, the hook and I sang the chorus and I sang all the ad libs. How much should I charge, you know? Because often you say, oh, we just, they say, oh, we just need you to just do some oohs and ahs. And then you get there and it's like, it's the oohs and ahs plus a verse and plus a chorus and all of the harmonies and all of this sort of stuff. So sometimes yeah. I price myself out of it. You know, sometimes it's for people that you want to work for, but you know that they are full of mischief. And um, and if you do it for that, you set a precedent almost. Yeah. So now I sort of, I throw big numbers in there with lots of zeros at the back. And so then sort of say, well, if they pay me that, then it's all good. And if they don't, I've lost nothing because I don't want to be um, in a position where I found myself before. Yeah. And I mean, as well, going back to what we were talking about, you guys being up there, as far as I'm concerned, as vocalists, 
we come from such or from an era of such great music, vocalists, that, you know, the standard is high that you all are following. That's why when I, I kind of listen to what's going on now, I think, well, you're not really a vocalist. You, you've got, you're holding a tune, but, you know, you guys have got range. You've got range. Yeah, there are a few singers out there that can ha handle themselves. You know, there are, you know, the, of the newer singers that are coming through in my reckoning. But, you know, you're possibly quite right. You know, um, I think that the learning of the craft bit is so important. You know, Joanna was saying that her son wants to get to be a professional singer and make a living out of it and so on and so forth. But it isn't just about vocal ability. It is about um, turning up on time. It is yeah, about yeah. professionalism. Professionalism, you know, and yeah. being nice to people, being kind to people from from the stage door right through to the woman that makes your cup of tea before you go on stage. Be nice to people. What my mum has always said to me: It's nice to be important, but much more important to be nice. Couldn't be put any more simply. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I love, and I get again. I say I love what I do. You know, Joanna was just saying. You know, it's it's difficult to kind of walk away from it, even if I thought like this current time that we're living through, how it's affecting our industry. Um, you know, let's write a couple of songs about that. Not directly saying, you know, not, not nothing di too direct saying COVID ain't going to get me down, but trying to find us a way. The of, essence of what's going on at yeah. the time. Because and, really and truly there's so much material for this year alone, whether yeah. it be COVID and its effects, whether it be Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, whether it be, <laughs> well, if you're in the UK and Europe, Brexit, there's so much material. Yeah, there's you know? so much. And, and even the the effects of the COVID and the grieving for the many people that you may have lost, it's touched people in so many different ways, whether it yeah. they have been sick or they know people who have been sick or have died, there's a lot of material there. Yeah. So Joanna, what was your first professional job that you got paid? Well, you know, this is an interesting story because we've been, you know, we've been talking about you know, I think Mary, Mary's and my journeys are similar but different. So, interestingly, um, when I recorded uh, Skin on Skin, which, as I say, has not has never been released up until now, um, I I had a real moment where I just thought I don't I don't know that I really want to be in the industry anymore. Wow. So I got I got really burnt. Um okay. and I won't go into all that, but it did it did lead me to a really quite a, a, a dark place in my life and I, I wasn't happy. Disillusioned. So, so then do you know I decided I wanted to do something different. Um and I wasn't I wasn't saying that I wasn't gonna sing anymore. I just thought I've I've had enough of the industry, right? So I then trained to be a nurse. I did um, half, half my nurse training in just general nursing. And then I trained as a psychiatric nurse. Oh, and yeah. I went on a, on, an, on a very different and interesting journey. So my, my life has been one where I've sort of worked in the music industry and and done some incredible things but I've also up until just this year um worked within the NHS so I I this is why I say our you know our journey our journeys are our own you know <laughs> we all have different journeys and um I can truthfully say that that I've I've lived that sort of double dual life with these two things sitting side by side, sometimes comfortably, sometimes not so com comfortably. Yeah. You know? yeah. 
but ultimately the music has always still been in you that's the thing the music is there whether i like it or not the music is never going to leave me and no it's never going to leave rishi sunak you can't retrain <laughs> <laughs> indeed how dare he how dare he well i was just seeing on the oh you know i was just seeing on 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 social media you know that the, the government did i could swear but i'm not going to they're saying you know they're putting out these adverts now you know do you want to retrain do you want to retrain mm. don't don't go telling people of our age People who have given their that lives. their vocation of the last however many years you know, is, is. I mean, that is know, just disrespectful, if nothing else. You know? Disrespectful, if nothing else. But you see that. So my so my so my journey's been that. So my first proper job was as um, I worked on a psychiatric unit in Hackney um, in 1986. Huh? No, no, 1990, hang on, 96. Sorry. 96, I was going to say. Um, the year, interestingly, when my vocal was sampled and um, someone used my, a bit of the first time ever to produce this song called The Gift, which went into the chart at, 90, um, at uh, number 17, I think. Wow. And I was doing my first job whilst then going to do Top of the Pops as well. So how crazy is that? Yeah, wow. I've, yeah, I've done that one. I've definitely done that one. I definitely. What was yours, Mary? What was your first first My professional first job gig? Professional job as a singer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well you're I, only fifteen, so it can't be that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was. I I used to be a picture framer and a purveyor of fine art. Wow. And I got, as I said, I was going to these singers clubs and doing these sort of singers nights and leaving there at three o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was and getting on the night bus. I wasn't even driving in those days. I'd get on the N78 back to Croydon. And so this one day I was in there and I was doing this. Uh, I was at Zenon Singers and a lady came up to me. She had on a hat and she was all kind of cloistered in and I was, and, and she came up, she goes, oh, can I speak to you a moment? And I went, yeah. And she goes, um, my name's Juliet and I'd like you to do a session for me. And I looked and I was like, you're Juliet Roberts. And she goes, yeah, yeah, don't worry about, can you be at this place at this time tomorrow? I was like that. Uh, uh, yeah. And I had a proper job, a real job, a real job. Well, you don't, you know, you don't get to kind of walk out, but I said, oh, could I take my lunch break? <laughs> and I took my lunch break and I came back two hours later, you know, um, and went off and did this session. I jumped in a black taxi. I was so green that I didn't even know that I was going to get paid. Um, and she called So that me. worked out well with the taxi then. <laughs> she called me six weeks later and said uh do you want to be paid for this session and I went am I getting paid <laughs> she said uh yeah well how much and she paid me I don't know something like 250 quid I was like that what <laughs> like 250 quid for singing for two hours and we were doing she had a track called um Another place, another day, another time. Who's fooling who? Beautiful tune. And um, and then she sent me, like, uh, in for Christmas, she sent me the single, a poster, and a this and a that. I got the vinyl, and then it was signed from her. And I was like, oh, my God. You know? Um, but, yeah, you know, about six weeks later, I finally sent an invoice. I didn't even know that I had to invoice. I didn't even know anything. I was that green. So my first professional job was doing a session for Juliet Roberts. And that gave you the taste for it. And you just thought, you know what? There's okay. nothing else for me. That stone well, gathered that? moss from that moment. There, there's nothing else for me. Because no. you were in Working Week, isn't it? Juliet was in Working Week, yeah. What's this song, the single that you sang? Na, 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 ready for the weekend. Oh. 
That was Calvin Harris. Calvin Harris, that's it. That was a nice falsetto there, Barry. Yeah. Come on, let's hear some more of that. <laughs> but it's a little bit higher, so it's all like, oh, I you, then I'm ready for the weekend. Up there. Yeah, yeah edit that bit out. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we're keeping it all in. <laughs> but... um. Yeah, so yeah, that was for Calvin Harris, and that was one of those moments where did the session, and then um, you know you don't read the fine print enough, and suddenly, where with with it, within the industry, if you get the letter O or you get the letter A, so you get an other featured artist, or there's another letter that you're supposed to get. So one pays you six grand, and the other one pays you ninety grand. And I paid, I got paid for the one that pays me shit. Mm. Oh dear. Well, anywho. Anywho. But I mean, nobody remembers Calvin singing what the verse, how the verse goes, but they just remember me singing the hook. So, but yeah, I exactly. Know. Because that's the bit that sticks in your head. Yeah. Yeah. So I did get, um, that was that was a very sort of bitter pill to swallow at the time and there but he's called me for sessions since then mary could you come and sing the second line on the first verse i'm like yeah sure how much and he's like how much are you going to charge me i'm like 10 grand <laughs> absolutely and he's like oh, are you still trying to get back that 10 grand okay Good. So yeah, but you know, because you know what Calvin Harris's stuff does, so you know, you know where that goes. It's everywhere. Yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, keep, you know, um, you, 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 but you know, you, I didn't, I didn't have an argument with anybody about it. I didn't, you know, I just licked my wounds and, moved and handled on. it like the gracious lady that you are. Yes. Right. What is your favorite food? Joanna. <laughs> you know the answer to that question. <laughs> no, I don't actually. What's the favourite? Not your worst. We'll get to the worst in a minute. <laughs> but what is your favourite? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Um, my favourite food is lobsters. <gasps> okay. <laughs> any kind of shell, oh. any kind of fish. <laughs> But definitely a lovely grilled lobster. Absolutely. A girl after my own heart. Yeah. And you, Mary? Um, my favourite thing to eat is, I have to say it, is ackee and saltfish. I am so Jamaican, it's not funny. Really? Is that your favourite? I favorite? love it. And, you know, and I, and I have to say that I cook it very well and do the fried dumplings and the whole nine yards, <laughs> everything. Um, to the point where my daughter has requested it over tis the season to be jolly fa la 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 <laughs> so she but that's has, the breakfast anyway isn't it that's the christmas breakfast it, it, in my house it can come any time of the day absolutely the dinner you know with your favorite thing barry white rice <laughs> can i just say this interview has been terminated <laughs> He hates white rice. Ooh, the only thing that should be white is a shirt. <laughs> Let me tell you. Oh, only thing that should be white is a shirt. Definitely not rice. Yeah, no, definitely ackee and saltfish and, you know, yeah. Yeah. So do we have to get to the worst thing to eat? What's your worst, Mary? The thing cheese. that you hate most. I know you hate I would never eat cheese. cheese. Never ever. She hates cheese. <laughs> see the point of it I mean I bought some for my husband today and it and you know I bought him cooking camembert and some other some kind of other cheese Wensleydale oh it stinks <laughs> um, but he's a Danish man and he likes his cheese and the stinkier the better I don't know what I'm doing when I'm buying cheese I just think, 
that looks interesting. <laughs> and, it, and, and I think it's got like... But you do kind of go to specialist cheese shops to get your cheese. You don't go off the shelf in Tesco's. You know, well, you, you, you go to the specialist where you can ask and, you know... Well, get, I can ask and, and get, get, a, get a real sort advice. of... Yeah, you know, it's like a little gift, you know, for him. Now, can um, I tell you that Joanna Law's mother actually had me eating cheese and Christmas cake. Yes, that's what I thought. She said, try it. Let me tell you now. That was three years ago. Hunk of cheese on my black cake every time. Lord of mercy. It's so nice. You'd never yeah. believe it. So the, nice. The Jamaicans do that. They put cheese on. On top. sweet. On yeah. Top and all of, but, yeah, of course. Sweet and savory go well together. So we've done the lobster, Joanna. What is the worst? <laughs> I think I know this one. Why do I have to keep terminating this interview? I don't understand. I've never had to do this before. <laughs> well, it begins with C and ends in D. <laughs> you can say the word. It's not going to make you ill, is it? <laughs> if you say the word. Custard. Custard. Oh man, Joanna, we've had this conversation before. Incomprehensible. I don't understand. I don't How understand do it. I'm, I mean, I'm <laughs> lactose intolerant and I love custard. Custard doesn't like me. I but love you will, you are prepared to hyperventilate on the floor in hives. I am scared to not leave my house for two days for the sake of custard. On the ventilator, just for a yeah. bowl of custard. <laughs> yeah, you know. And clear. Yeah. Honestly, I don't understand why you can't eat custard. Custard is righteous. But we had the most hilarious day at Borough Market at this restaurant. And <laughs> meal was wonderful. Dessert came out. And, you know, it was apple crumble. How do you do apple crumble without custard? It's, it's, it's beyond belief. So I've said, this little thimble of custard that you've brought me is not nearly enough for this apple crumble because I want it lathered, okay, in yeah. custard. I see this one's face going, <laughs> I thought something was, I'm looking around now and she, <laughs> I'm looking around now doing this thinking something's on me. I said, what happened to you? It's the custard. Whoa, the custard. <laughs> wow. So hence this picture on social media with me going. <laughs> I, got, I could not things understand. Have never been, things have never been the same things since. Things have really. never been quite right since. That no. whole episode has upset my equilibrium. I still yeah. love you, but you know, things are slightly different. But that's okay. <laughs> It's a bit tense. <laughs> fragrances, girls. What are your favorite fragrances? Hmm. Um, the f things that I like to smell. I don't. I love the smell of freshly cut grass. Hmm. That's delicious. As in fragrance on you. What's your favorite fragrance? Oh, what a real perfume. Yeah. Oh well, it's got to be Creed. Ooh. Okay. And you, Joanna? Yeah. Um, I I I love Paul Smith Rose. Okay. Fragrance by Paul Smith called Rose. It's lovely. I've I've been wearing that for a long time now. Yeah. My favorite fragrance is not even a male fragrance. Have a guess. I'm a bit of a traditionalist, as you know. Chanel. <laughs> number, five. number five is the ultimate. I will put that just a little spot here so that I can smell it all day. Oh, I okay. absolutely love it. Yeah. Well, I just wanted the viewers to get a little personal side of you girls, the journey, the career, the things you like and dislike. And well, I love you, Barry. Um, me to it. And, I was just and, about to say that. And the apps, what people need to know is that you are a super intelligent and 
um, the funniest fella. I honestly, ladies and gentlemen, you need to know that this man constantly takes me to the brink. Even when I'm not supposed to be laughing, he has me giggling, you know, uncontrollably, uh, just through the stuff that he puts up on social media, the stories and the visual thing that you go through, even though it's through written word. Honestly, um, Barry Thomas, you're an amazing human. And um, that's very sweet of you, darling. Very kind. We, I know Joanna loves you to bits and pieces as well. So, yeah, we've kind of <laughs> overcome the custard thing. We've got well, we, that. we've agreed to disagree. <laughs> But I tell you what, I think we I think there's a TV show in this somewhere, you know, trying because you've mentioned your thing about cheese, Mary. You know, you 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 were critical of, of risotto that I ate, Barry. You know, I yeah. I'm not a fan of custard. In fact, ugh. so you know, I think we need to get a chef. We need to get a chef on board. And sort of try and, you know, get people to like what they say they dislike. Oh, very oh, good wow. idea. Very good yeah, idea. Yeah, no, nobody's good. My husband tried to get me to eat cheese. It's not good. <laughs> it's not good. But, um, <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I always love to be able to speak to you, Barry. And you have introduced me to some very lovely people, too. So, um really grateful that you are you and that you're in my life and it's so lovely to meet like this Mary hopefully we'll meet in person again soon yeah yes, we've met we have before, to do it but... properly when all this craziness is over yeah. but I well, thought this would be a nice lost, yeah a nice opportunity for us to actually get together and <laughs> I have to say, Mary, you really went to town with that makeup. It looks fabulous. Oh, does it? Hold on. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Termination number three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Yes, it's lovely, dear. Please don't make me do number four. Please don't make me do number four. <laughs> yes. We're suitably impressed. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, honestly, it's been amazing talking to you. And um, I just want to wish, by the time people see this, I hope that you've had a fantastic Christmas and a scintillating new year. Um, and we're looking forward to bigger and brighter things I'm gonna now appreciate every gig that I I really do love what I do but I'm gonna appreciate every single gig that I do for as long as I can I I think this is we we look back on the things we actually took for granted and we go now you know what nothing is promised and we've always heard those adages but ultimately if 2020 has taught us anything it is that we can take absolutely nothing for granted, totally. including our liberty and freedom to, totally. you know, to just live life. Totally. So like, I think we were totally fortunate in the area, the era that we grew up in because we were free. You jumped on a bus and you went wherever. You jumped on a train and went wherever. Didn't think about getting home. You're, oh, don't worry. We'll just go to the club and we'll we'll worry about getting home, even if we have to walk halfway. That that freedom, but you know that you're seeing how it's being eliminated and it's being removed. And the children now don't have the freedom that we had already. They're a generation that are being born into wearing masks and social distancing from as young as primary school. How awful is that? Seeing children to separate themselves from their best friend. They don't understand. And seeing adults around them yeah. with masks on. I mean, even when I walk into, you know, I've been doing some work with um, young people uh, at, at a school locally. And I'm telling you, when they see you walk in, they all repel if you're wearing a mask. So yeah. I, I, I think that, yeah, we, we really need to 
you know, find a, a way of getting through this so that our young people are not too damaged by it. Yeah. Just awful. But well, I mean, ladies, in Japan, they wear masks all the time. Yeah, but we are in a different environment completely. Mm. So, well, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you both. And I want you all to give your singles and your social medias a shout because I want to put it all up there. So start with you, Joanna. Let's hear the name of this album. And let's go. Single, well, album. Um, there's two singles. So um, uh, First Time Ever and Skin on Skin are now available digitally. Uh, right. Spotify, iTunes, all those things now. And then um, hopefully in March, I would say um, the whole album, which will be called Rhythm of Years, is going to be out. So right. that's okay. got a lot of stuff on there that, you know, has never been out before, only on vinyl. So it'll, right. be, it'll be a lovely collection of music. It's a labour of love for me, and I'm going to be so happy for Wonderful. having it there, accessible. <laughs> and your Royal Highness, Mary Pierce. <laughs> Well, you, you know, as I said to you, I've done this project, The Labour of Love with Richie Stevens and um, the, um, the Smudge All-Stars, um, you know, and I'm just so pleased to be part of that. And also I've done a track, another track with uh, Boy George, which is about um, Sister Mary Ignatius, who... Okay. You know, she started that school in Jamaica where all of our um, lovely musicians came from. And um, I've done a track of it and I'm, you know, and I'm chatting, toasting on that track and singing. When is this out? Is it out it's, already? It's not out already, but it's out soon. I will let you know, Barry. And I okay. will let you know before anybody else so that I don't get cuss out again. Because you know it will happen. Okay. Okay. Be very scared. <laughs> Ladies, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful evening. The pleasure was all mine. No, and no, no. The pleasure was mine. And we will definitely reconvene post-COVID. Yay! I can't wait to be dancing again. Reunited is coming, don't worry. That's spring, spring, it will be there. <laughs> Ladies, lots of love. All the very best. Happy Christmas. And God indeed. bless. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>